take issue with oozing. Right? <laughs> I rarely ooze. And also I'm going to take credit for uh, bringing to this group the most slides ever in a presentation. When I sent it to Jordan she was uh, kind of freaking out. Like, you know, you got to be done at 9.30. Anyway, welcome and um, thanks for uh, coming and putting up with me. I want to uh, talk about the rabbit hole, but first we're going to talk about magic, because that's the, that's the word of the day in Pee Wee's Playhouse. Um, so uh, in the best books, there's always magic. Sometimes the magic is the magic. Sometimes it's only half as much. It can also be the magic of our everyday lives. or a series of small miracles. It could be the nighttime magic of going to sleep, or the growing up magic in our hopes and dreams, or just the ordinary magic of what a friend can be. For anyone who has grown up with books, there's always one or two books that we remember vividly. Books that comfort, and books that somehow changed us. For me, reading came late. When I was a kid, I went to this school. I played all the time outside for hours and hours. And I watched TV a lot. <laughs> Even though my dad was a professor, I rarely read books. When I finally did take an interest in books in high school, this is the book that changed me. This is the book that made me into a reader. This is the page. <laughs> and this is the passage that cast a spell. Up until then, I didn't know what you could actually write in a book. <laughs> So the weird thing about this is that, and this is, this is true, uh, but I needed some images, and it turns out I'm not the only one who has been inspired in this way. <laughs> I merely had to Google Vonnegut plus asshole, and there it all was. So there's a group of us. Meet me afterwards. We can... <laughs> so that, that's sort of a relief because, uh, yeah, I'm not the only one in the world who associates the magic of books with this. <laughs> in any case, the real magic, the deep magic of a book isn't what it's about per se or whether it has actual magic, but rather how it connects with us and advances the way we think about ourselves and the world around us and how it helps us discover our own story within the larger story of the big wide world. Casting the spell has become harder. If you don't grow up around books, getting the magic isn't always easy. The act of reading itself has become an ordeal uh, for many. There are reasons for this. Only 50%, 50 to 55% of parents read to their kids on a regular basis, and this has been a very dependable statistic for the last 25 years. We live in a world now of growing distraction. And we've mechanized reading and have come to rely on the reward systems so that reading begins to look and feel like a chore. And if you live in poverty, things are even bleaker. So we have this bigger problem. And the consequences are real and chronic. Functional illiteracy predicts failure in school, in work, in life, in general. 
14% of American adults can't read, 21% can't read above a fifth grade level. Many programs have been implemented over the years to address literacy and grade level reading early on using standardized strategies in the classroom to build reading skills that allow outcomes to be measured and monitored. Unfortunately, we're often sucking the magic out of books in this process so that the crisis-driven model starts to resemble a theater of war. I kind of just love that. I don't know why. <laughs> Where literature and the joy of reading become collateral damage in our efforts, in our best efforts. And while I wouldn't go so far as to say that the cure is worse than the disease, I would say that oftentimes the cure is being delivered at the expense of literature itself and the greater good of reading, particularly in public school regimens, which has made reading for fun seem like an oxymoron to a lot of kids. So it's no wonder that we've come to rely on re reward systems to motivate readers. Here's a big one. Pizza. <laughs> Pizza is a big one. You read 500 books, you get a slice of pizza. First of all, nobody reads 500 books. And second of all, pizza is not a very good reward. <laughs> Here's a better one, but it's still ridiculous. Like, we need more time on PlayStation. And here's the, the, bottom, of the bottom of the barrel. Read that book. I'll give you 20 bucks if you finish it. These sorts of incentives might help some kids uh, read on demand, but they will never ever produce lifelong readers. So here's the disconnect. We want all our kids not simply uh, to read, not simply as a utility, uh, but for the joy and the enormous cognitive benefits that reading can deliver. We know that the activity of reading is one of the most important of all human activities, functionally, intellectually, and spiritually. We just know this. I mean, everybody knows this. If you don't know that, you're not a reader, I guess. And we know that our culture rests on the foundation of literature and <laughs> We love our movies a lot. A little art now and then, but never enough. You know, I'm in, a, I'm in the building. We need to celebrate the, uh, when, you, when you drag your kids here. Uh, we're obsessed with food. Sometimes when I go downtown in Kansas City, I think if I'm not going to eat something or have a wedding, I should not be there. <laughs> we're building the place where books live, in the rabbit hole. And we've dubbed it the world's first exploratorium. Inside of the rabbit hole, which does not exist yet, Inside the building of the rabbit hole, uh, there will be an evolving wonderland of narrative interventions, stories come to life, discoverable environments, and connections that we make between uh, the history and the contemporary practice of children's literature. This is a hundred year panorama that we're planning so that when you come into this wild and raucous, uh, adventure of the rabbit hole, you can find a fixed point and find a context for what some of the things you're looking at. Within all of that, we'll have two 3,000 square foot galleries committed to a single title. Could be a picture book, could be a novel, where we create the journey of that book, where you can walk through books. Those will be uh, created and recreated every four months, so every, every time you come back to the rabbit hole, you'll get a new experience. You'll also find new things in the building itself. Some of the things in the building that you might find, for example, uh, are Max's room from the Wild Things. That would be something that might just be there all the time, and you could, well, we might see an image if we can get the technology to work of, of that. But these galleries are really um, instrumental because it allows us and and the people visiting to discover new stories and new relationships and books um, that they might not have seen before. And that we'll be working directly with the authors and illustrators to create these. We'll have a, several galleries, but a discovery gallery where you can interact with the work, you can um, learn about the author, and you can see the original artwork from the book. Multiple 
levels of engagement with story. So if you walk through an exhibit upstairs, you might go down into our Rabbit Warren Theater and catch Paul Mesner puppeting that show or, or show by another, another book by that author. We really want to do this like underground, kind of weird grassy knoll in the basement thing. <laughs> Should be really fun. Uh, we, we're going to have a print shop and a bindery. Um, this is a quiet but big part of our project because it, it does a lot of things. It helps us run. It kind of becomes the epicenter of our writing and story labs, uh, so, which will be patterned in some ways after 826 Valencia, something Dave Eggers uh, brought to us um, many years ago and has really exploded. Uh, it's a great model. Um, we'll be able to make books with kids and with adults. Another aspect of this project is to create, um, to bring in authors nationally and locally to work on books together outside of a market environment um, on our press. So we will have a rabbit hole in print. And that's great because when they come in, they can also do mentoring with uh, younger and older kids. And of course, the Reading Reptile will uh, kind of uh, have a renaissance in the rabbit hole. And that'll be our gift shop slash bookstore. It'll be a working bookstore. So if you just wanted to bring kids to story time, you can do that. It doesn't, you don't have to, um, you know, go into that sweatshop, the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> and lose your kids. Uh, uh, we'll have book clubs and stuff. So it'll have a lot of different levels. And we'll still be doing, you know, a full, like I say, a working bookstore. Um, the great part about our project, again, is, is the connection to the industry itself. And our, our National Advisory Board is a testament to that fact. We have some of the greatest living authors and illustrators on our, um, on our uh, National Advisory Board, including Lisa Campbell Ernst, who's sitting here today. Um, she's Kansas City's pride and legend in picture book making. Um, that is just the tip of the iceberg, and that will evolve as well as we move on. There will be new, new boards and new people. Um, it's, this is a curated experience. This isn't um, you know, a promotional marketing opportunity for publishers, although it is, but it's on, <laughs> it's on our terms. So they will be involved on a project basis. So we, they'll be bringing us stuff that they want us to, to look at, and we'll be able to sort through. And maybe if there's an anniversary, for example, of The Little House by Virginia Lee Burton, we do a big thing, because that's a book that fits into our vision. This is where we are now. We're in, uh, we're in a little workshop down on the boulevard. Um, this is our, our headquarters for now. It's a temporary space. Uh, we bring people there to beg them for money, and we also <laughs> bring children and families and anybody who wants to learn about the rabbit hole, uh, to, and we show them. And there's Debbie showing uh, uh, some kids about what the rabbit hole is going to be so they can understand the vision. We invite you all to come down on Fridays. We have open studio. It's very casual. In fact, we might ignore you, but you can come in and hang around and, uh, and look at what we're making and, and talk, and it's fun. And right now, so we are busy making models and designs for future projects and exhibits. We are thinking about things and trying to get ahead of the curve. Once we do get a building, things are going to start moving very quickly. You can see some of the stuff in our workshop. One of the things we needed to do, one of, the big, um, one of our big efforts this year is to demonstrate some of the things that we plan to bring to Kansas City uh, in terms of exhibits. And um, the first one thing we made was a Captain Underpants uh, outreach pop-up. So this is a traveling uh, prototype for a traveling uh, pop-up exhibit featuring the adventures of Ca Captain, Captain Underpants, which, has, which is one of the best-selling books in kids' literature uh, and also one of the most banned books in kids' mm -hmm. literature. It's, it's structured like a uh, Victorian pop-up book. It's a three-part uh, exhibit that can be um, engaged on many different levels and it's made out of 30 sheets of plywood and it can be put up and taken down in an hour and a half. Um, we have it traveling from school to school. It's booked through February already. We did 12 schools this uh, uh, spring and four libraries and um, it's 
we've surveyed teachers and they are hungry, hungry, hungry for enrichment opportunities around literature. And it's not just reading and writing, although of course this is a, a graphic novel uh, uh, that Dave's made. But uh, so comic book making and writing and, and drawing is a big part of it, but there are other uh, curriculum activities as well. The, another huge uh, project we pulled off this spring was an immersive storybook gallery. So this is one of those, an example of one of those galleries I was talking about earlier. And um, this we built at 17th and Oak in, in this building. And we, um, we ran it for six weeks. It was only open to the public on weekends. We did uh, easily 2,000 plus in just the public on those few days that we were open and uh, hosted 20 schools over that time period in, in a very short preparation period too. Again, showing the schools are, had already expended their budgets for buses, uh, real, really eager to get down there and see it. Um, this is based again on the incredible painting of Felix Clouseau, which was written by John Agee. Um, we had docents for this particular experience. Um, so the kids or the adults would come and we would guide them through uh, the work this was about a 3,500 square foot area. Um, so we told this story and Charlie Miley, who's one of our, he's done all the conceptual renderings, most of them for the rabbit hole. We had him in a little box there so <laughs> kids could come by and he played the artist and, and uh, would draw uh, sometimes sketchy drawings for them. <laughs> in Charlie's manner. How many people know Charlie? Yeah, he's the best. Hire Charlie, pop up Charlie. Economical and well worth your, your, your corporate funds. He'll, he'll take anybody's money. I'm gonna start wrapping it up. Our priority right now is um, a building. So we've been looking at a lot of buildings uh, over the last year and a half and now we've kind of ramped that up. Unfortunately, this is the worst time in the history of Kansas City to find a building. Um, you're fighting tooth and nail with not just people here, but from everywhere, uh, Denver and et cetera. So I did, you know, uh, I came to this late and Jordan was really stressing about this presentation and I hadn't finished it. So this was the end and I thought that can't be the end. This is the end. <laughs> uh, I just threw something in there, but I wanted to add one quick thing before I say, Goodbye, and I was just in the gallery uh, a few minutes ago looking at the C. Armajani uh, stuff. And I have a quick funny story about that. Oh, I was in St. Paul in 1987. Uh, I was working in a gas station on Grand Avenue, um, Sinclair Station. And it was a snowy night, and I used to get high and, and sit in the garage bay and wait, you know, but it was snowing and there was no customers. So um, I was just reading, you know, whatever. Um, and pretty high, and then this car, <laughs> this car pulled in, and that was the days when it was always self-serve, so like you'd have to go. Uh, so I went out and I filled this guy's tank, and then uh, it was very cold, bitter cold, and the window came down just a little bit. And the car came out and I pulled it, and I had to go back to the, back to my um, place and get the swiper. And I looked at the car, and it was C. Armajani, right? So he's from St. Paul, and I had just visited his studio with a class or something. And I, came, I brought the card back out and I put it back through the slot and I said, are you the C.R. Armajani? And the window came down. <laughs> he, was, he was looking at this kid with a green Sinclair suit on. He was just like, <laughs> like recognized him. <laughs> like this is what being an artist is, right? Nobody knows who you are, but the guy at the gas station knew, right? <laughs> so so he, he talked, we talked for a long time, right? And, um, and uh, he was, and his wife was in the cartoon. She was pissed off because it was so cold, and he went. <laughs> but he, the last thing he said to me was, "Don't stop making work," because I was making art at that time. Um, and he was, "Don't stop making work," and I said, "I won't." And when I was over there looking, so to me that was a magical moment because I got to make contact with somebody, sort of in a very surprise fashion and, and then it was this very encouraging moment and the snow was coming down and it was, it was just soft, everything was soft. Anyway, I was over in the gallery and, and there's a part of the description on the wall says Martin Heid talks about Martin Heidegger and was one of his inspirations and Heidegger describes the bridge 
as a phenomenological gathering of object and idea, earth and sky, divinities and mortals. And when I read that, I thought about my presentation and um, to kids, a lot of times, adults seem like divinities. I mean, to little kids, you seem like kind of like immortal and godlike. And that's, um, to me, where the book can become that bridge between uh, an adult and a kid and kind of make that connection in the same way that Armageddon's work works. So that's where I wanted to stop. Thank you.